Welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Bei Wong, and she'll be telling us about topology of artificial neuron activations in deep learning from images to word embeddings. All right. Thanks uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, so um, everything I talk about today, uh, the paper is published. Uh, you can find it on my website. Um, and then a lot of them come with code, so you can play with it. Um, so, you know, first of all, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, the talk I'm giving today actually come from three different papers. Uh, the first one is called Topo Bird, and it's recently published. And it's actually uh, led by my PhD student, Achet, um, and then uh, my collaborator, Vivek. Um, and then the second piece of work is a slightly older work, but it gives you a little bit more context into the initial exploration of uh, word embeddings and its topology. Uh, and then the third piece of work is a uh, sort of collaboration with uh, folks at PNNL, uh, Emily, Davis, Brett, Cliff, Brenda, and then my student, uh, and also Madeline uh, from uh, PNNL. Um, and my student, uh, Yuja, did uh, a bunch of work in that space. And also, of course, my funding agency. So the main piece of topology I'm going to talk about is coming from this concept of mappergraph. Uh, mappergraph is, in some sense, a discrete approximation of a topological object called a rib graph. Uh, but I'm going to go straight to point cloud setting. Uh, there's a lot of theoretical work surrounding rib graph um, and its high dimensional uh, version, which is rib spaces. Um, uh, but I'm not going to go into that today. But today I'm going to go straight into how do you construct a, a mapper graph from point cloud data. So in this case, uh, I'm giving a toy example where I have a two-dimensional point cloud sample from two circles. Um, but of course, uh, moving forward, you want to imagine each of those points is a high-dimensional point. Uh, it can be coming from uh, neural activations from uh, image classifiers, or it can come from high-dimensional word embeddings coming from, say, large language models such as BERT. Okay? So what is sort of a mapper? Uh, it's a popular tool in topological data analysis. And one way to think about it is a way to visualize the skeleton of high dimensional point cloud. Um, and specifically, the main idea is I want to turn the point cloud into a graph, uh, which I call mapper graph, uh, that captures both clusters and cluster relations. Oh, I forgot a reference here. This is a work done uh, back in 2007 um, uh, uh, by Singh et al. Um, that is published, uh, that started all this uh, line of work. All right, so uh, here is a, a example of how mapper graph is constructed. Uh, I have a point cloud and uh, each point is equipped with what I call a filter function. Sometimes it's also referred to uh, as a lens in the original paper. So the idea in this case, uh, my filter function is simple. So it's just its height or Y coordinates. And uh, what I have here is that uh, I'm going to obtain a cover of the range. Oh, it went a little bit too fast. Uh, sometimes my keyboard went a little bit. Okay, one step. Okay, so this function is going to have a range. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the range of my function by a bunch of interval. So V1 to V5 is a uniform a length interval that has some overlap. And this is by design, such that the union of those interval uh, covers the range of my function. Um, now. For a given interval, say V1, what I'm going to look at is a F inverse of V1, which is the inverse image of it in the original point cloud. So now what you see here, I'm representing as a rectangle, it contains points whose function value belongs to this interval. And then in the mapper construction, what you do is you apply a clustering uh, to this point cloud. So in this case, I'm using DB scan, and I'm assuming the point is dense enough. So this DB scan, which is a density-based clustering algorithm, is going to return one cluster. So represented by an orange node on the right. Now I'm moving on to the next interval. And again, I'm going to look at the inverse image under this uh, height function. And uh, if I apply DB scan, um, a density-based clustering, it will return three cluster two, three, and four. So those clusters are represented as a node in my mapper graph. And I keep doing this, you know, inverse image of V3 gives us four cluster, V4 inverse image gives three, and inverse image of V5 gives one cluster. And then the final step is that if there's two cluster that has non-empty intersection, in this case, the point, point cloud inside 
the rectangle U1 and then points inside the rectangle U2 has a non-empty intersection. So I have an edge between them. So by doing this, I'm going to connect all the clusters with each other. And uh, that become my skeleton. Oops, sorry. Now you have to bear with my animation again. <laughs> my keyboard is a little bit too sensitive today. Okay, so what you see here on the right is a skeleton of the point cloud on the left. And uh, with appropriate choice of parameters, I can see that my skeleton still captures the two loops from my original data, right? There's a lot of theoretical work in this space as well, which is how do I select the parameters? How do I uh, study the convergence as I sample more and more points? How is this uh, space, uh, how is the mapper graph on the right converge to the rib graph, which is the situation uh, where the number of interval goes to infinity um, and the number of points goes to infinity and so on. So there's a lot of theoretical work in this space. But here today, my talk is very applied. Um, on the high level, what you can think about is that I'm going to treat the points on the left to be high dimensional point from now on. And then they are coming from deep learning models. All right, any questions? Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Yeah, we have one in here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so just real quick on, on interpretation. So if I'm understanding correctly, the clusters are represented by the vertices and yes. the clusters are represented by edges. The cluster relations are represented by cluster, by edges. So if I have two cluster that are related to each other through non-empty intersection, then there's an edge between them. Okay, but how, how does this model, like, um, does this differentiate between, like, my clusters overlap a lot versus just, like, one point of intersection, right? Uh, just... Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you can. So you can have weights on the edges. Um, for example, I can weight the edges by the size of intersection. Sure. Um, or I can weight the edges by uh, JCAR index. By what index, sorry? Uh, JCAR. So JCAR, JCAR index between uh, two uh, sets is sort of the intersection over union. So it's right. a way of still looking at intersection, but normalized by the size of the sets. So it will have very high JCAR if they have a lot of overlap and it, very small JCAR if they have small overlap. Great, thank you. Yeah, actually in our interactive visualization tool, the edges is colored by different color and thickness, and that is either JCAR index or intersection size. Okay. All right. So the first thing, this is a triple AI paper this year. We're talking, we start by looking at image classifiers. So the first thing we do, uh, this is just a toy example of a convolutional neural network. Um, and uh, our work is focusing on, you start with the input data, and uh, you go through, uh, and usually there's a patch in the input data that goes through the neural network. And we're going to focus specifically on the um, convolutional layer. So in this specific case, uh, what you see on the lower button is that uh, we are going to get what's called a spatial activation. Uh, spatial activation on the high level is that for a specific image, um, I take a small patch, right? In this case, I take the lower left patch of a, I think it's a horse image. And uh, what you do is you obtain at a fixed layer of the neural network, the output of the neuron with respect to this input patch, image patch. So the way I visualize the, uh, the activation vector is the, the uh, where's my mouse? I lost my mouse. Anyway, it's a, it's a blue column in the cube that you see. So this, this is uh, what I call spatial activation. So if I probe my neural network with a large number of images, for each image, um, I can sample a spatial activation vector, or I can collect all of the activation vectors, right? But in this case, I'm going to start by talking about just sample one activation vector. When I say one activation vector, it means one of those columns, okay? Another way to think about this, uh, every slice, horizontal slice of this cube corresponding to a specific channel or specific neuron in a particular uh, particular layer. And then the column vector I collect are the output of all the neurons at that layer. And that form a high dimensional vector. Uh, in practice, the point cloud I'm gonna show you 
is of 512 dimension because at particular layer, which is the layer 16 of ResNet 18, uh, it has 512 neurons. So, uh, so that's what I mean by uh, neural activation. It's a high dimensional vector attached to each image. Okay. So the, my main question is, I want to study the topological, topological structure about uh, of those image activation. Okay. So, so the high level picture is that we want to look at the mapper graph, the mapper construction of those activation vector under different sampling condition, which I will describe very soon. The second thing is I would like to look at how this mapper graph evolve across different layer. And then the third one is how robust it is if I perturb the images. Um, and then finally is does the observation um, I obtain generalize to different model data pair. Okay. So th this is ex ex all, all I'm showing is experimental evidence. Okay. So the why I talk about this, this is to say for every single image. Uh, we have a, by the way, we, our image classifier is pre-trained already. So it has a, the one I'm going to show you has a very high classification accuracy. So once the network is already trained, I'm essentially using images to probe the network. And then this is a picture I was showing before. Every single column that I sample from the image is referred to as a spatial activation. It's called spatial because it's related to a special patch of the input image. And then this form a uh, point cloud that of my interest. Um, and now when I saw, first talk about sampling, uh, the first sampling method I do uh, is actually from our Topo Act work back in 2021, where for every single image, I only sample a random patch and I'm obtaining the activation from that random patch. There's also the version of what I call full activation. So for example, in the image I show here has 16 patches, four by four, it has 16 patches. So I'm going to collect all of those patches, okay? So which means that every single image is now in this particular example has 16 activation vectors, okay? But also I can be a little bit more specific. I can also look at activation vector that is associated with the foreground of the image or the activation vector that is associated with the background of the image. So what do I mean by that? So here's an image of a horse. This is from CIFAR 10. So CIFAR 10 images of pretty low resolution, but here's a horse and trust me, it's a horse. And what I do is I extract the foreground. So the foreground is mostly the body of the horse. And what I do is I, with this foreground images, I kind of zero out all its background. I still pass through all the convolution. In this case, there are 16 convolutional layer. I still kind of pick out the uh, convolution uh, uh, have this image go through all this convolutional layer, and at the end of each layer, I'm going to collect the activation that has sort of the largest overlap with the foreground. So in some sense, you can think about, I'm going to pick up one activation vector that uh, top one or top five activation vector that is mostly associated with the foreground pixels of the image. We can do the same thing for the background, of course. So here's the first, like my favorite picture, and I talk about this picture all the time, but here is a random um, activation from, um, from CIFAR 10. So there, CIFAR 10 is an image data set that has 10 classes, um, and uh, we are going to get uh, 5,000 images for each class. So for total, there's 50,000 images. And then images, uh, images, and then for each of those activation, it's a random sampled activation of dimension 512. So basically, I have a 50,000 images or 50,000 points where each point is in 512 dimension. And then model is ResNet 18. And then this is the activation vector at the end of the 16th convolutional layer, which is the last convolutional layer. Um, remember, I need a filter function for mapper graph. And we're using L2 norm of the activation vector. L2 norm basically, you know, justification is that it indicate how strongly the neural network is reacting to my input image, right? So if I if it has a large L2 norm, it means there are some neurons who has a very large output when they see a particular patch from the image. Um, and now what's really fun about this picture is that this is a mapper graph summary of the last layer, last convolutional layer of ResNet 18. It's a very highly uh, accurate model. So the 
uh, classification accuracy, I think it's like 98%. Um, so it has 10 classes. So you can see there's like interesting branching structure that related to uh, roughly 10 branches. There is a branch here that is very much, uh, so the way I visualize it is that if a node has, uh, a node in my micrograph has a pure color, it means that all the images that it contain have uh, a color by its uh, uh, ground truth label. So basically, if you look at a green node, oh, sorry, a blue node, which is corresponding to truck, it means all the activation or the images contained in that node uh, have the label truck, okay, and uh, and so on. And uh, of course, you see this sort of really really complex pie chart somewhere. Uh, those are the activations uh, that has a really low L2 norm. So there's a tail that has all these mixed classes. Those are low L2 norm activations. Okay. So let me dive into a little bit more. Not only that, I see a brand chain, but I see my favorite branch, which is deer and horse. So you see a little bit hierarchy among those classes. So there is sort of deer and horse branch a little bit later um, because they are kind of very similar to each other, except one has antler, the other one doesn't have antler. And you can actually look at the branching node where you will see a mix of, so the branching node, node 27, has a mix of uh, horse and deer nodes. Um, uh, and a lot of those uh, deer, deer images actually are pretty low quality because you can't see the antler. Um, the second branching you see, uh, actually on the upper left corner, it's a branching between a truck and uh, and the automobile. Uh, those are the orange and the blue branching also. So again, you are see a little bit hierarchy among the among the labels. Okay, so that's another really fun observation. Um, so this is with random sampling. So um, this is deer horse. So now the top is uh, the, if I just send sample random activation across layer. So from left to right, I'm going from layer eight to 12, 13, 15, 16. Those are layer from the ResNet 18. And then the general trend you see is that in earlier layers, the model hasn't really learned how to differentiate those classes. So the mapper graph also shows very mixed uh, behavior. Like, so again, I'm mostly looking at purity of the nodes you know, and, and so on. And roughly speaking at layer 15, you start to see some bifurcations, which means the model for certain classes is differentiating those classes, okay? The, the picture on the bottom are, instead of looking at randomly sampled activation, I'm gonna collect all activations. So the bottom mapper graph is basically 50K times like a hundred. So it's like close to a million, I think close to a million activations. But the mapper graph, again, uh, you, you are going to see at layer 16, um, it's still going to see the same sort of branching structure as you see from random sample. So this is an indication that, you know, even if I just sample randomly from those activation uh, vectors, I'm going to see this structure. And if I use all of them, I'm also going to see the structure. So in practice, it's okay to subsample this point cloud, you know, in terms of recovering this branching structure. So that's a first experiment. The second, in, so, in, Bay, in, yeah. in layer 16, why is it in the bottom row? Why is there so many fewer nodes? Is it, this just because yeah. you've mapped back down to a low dimension? No, 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 no. So, so the interesting part is that um, all those uh, mapper graph um, actually use the same set of mapper parameters. Um, so they all use, I don't know, 40 or 80 mapper intervals. It somehow uh -huh. happened to be like layer 16. I, I, this is more of me hand waving explanation, right? There's a, a lot more sort of concentrated clustering behavior than layer 15. Layer 15 actually in the same parameter has a lot more, how to say, islands and stuff. Ah, yeah. interesting. Thanks. So we haven't really dive much into the detailed structure of those. Um, right now, we're just looking at the global picture of it, right? Of course, there is always this question, how do we tune the parameters and so on and so forth? That is like sort of like a much longer conversation. Um, people who work with mapper algorithm knows that there's like several parameters you need to tune. One is number of intervals, amount of overlap, the filter function, the density clustering algorithm, and so on, right? But here we are basically looking at all of this under a set of fixed parameters. Okay. All right. So the next, so this is kind of like a zoom, zooming view of it. So the left is just random sample at layer 12. The right is full. Um, so layer 12, layer 16, you can see that left is a full activation, right is, uh, sorry, left is random, so random sample, right is 
like 1 million activations, you still see the nice branching structure between uh, horse and deer, which is purple and gray, and then um, automobile and, uh, and uh, truck, which is uh, automobile truck is a uh, light, light blue, like sky blue, and automobile is orange. Um, the interesting thing that you can see a little bit further is that on the full activation, again, this is very much parameter dependent, but you see a clustering of the transportation. So the sort of kind of yellow is, um, is ship. And then next to this, the branch is airplane. And next to it is truck and automobile, okay? So, so that whole branch is really transportation, actually. So, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So again, you see deer, horse, automobile, and truck. As I mentioned, automobile and truck, next to it are the two other transportation branches in the full activation space. Okay. All right, so this is what you see in foreground and background activation, as I described before. Again, uh, if you just look at layer 16, well, general trend, again, is as you go deeper, the bifurcation structure uh, looks much clearer, right? Because the model is improving. Um, but also at the last layer, layer 16, um, our original hypothesis is that the foreground is going to, of course, observe the branching, but it turns out the background also observes the, bran observe the branching. So in some sense that the foreground activation showcases uh, separation between clusters and background activation does the same thing. Um, there is a small argument is that sometimes, you know, if you show me the silhouette of a horse, people can still tell you that it's a horse, right? So that's sort of one of those arguments. And there's other information that is in the background. Like for example, if this grass, you know, it's likely some animal or some human figure, you know, with the background. But anyway, I don't, I, I this is a more, so everything I'm seeing here are more sort of conjectures. Uh, they're not really validated, but experimentally it shows that the foreground and background shows bifurcation structures as well. Okay, so this is again, you know, so the foreground, background, and random all shows this bifurcation. This is layer 15. And layers, well, actually, the interesting part, another thing is that one observation is that in the foreground activation, which is very much left picture, it shows the bifurcation even earlier at layer 15 instead of 16. So some of bifurcation appear to show up earlier when you focus on foreground or background activations than the random activations. Okay, so what's the next thing? Next thing is I'm going to inject noise more to my images. So in this case, I have original image of a automobile and I'm going to add Gaussian noise. And from left to right, I'm at more and more Gaussian noise. You can see the images become more and more noisy. And I'm going to probe using those images to probe my model. So this is a picture. Uh, the left is a mapper graph without noise. And from left to right, as you increase more and more noise, uh, the model, the, the sort of the branching structure is going to kind of slowly disappear, right? So again, this is in some sense uh, an indication that the model isn't doing so well with a really noisy image as it's not going to do well in terms of separating them. And then it's an indication where my topological structure is become, you know, less branch-like. Um, so this is a zoom in, you know, this is sort of like with perturbation, full activation on the left. Uh, foreground activation on the right with small noise, small level of noise, the branching structure persists. With larger amount of noise, it's kind of start to disappear and so on. And then finally, uh, we did experiments with uh, a different models. So the ones I've been showing are ResNet 18. Uh, we also look at Inception V1, Inception V3, AlexNet. Those are different uh, image classifiers. And then we also change the data set. The data set used to be CIFAR 10, so 10 classes. So for sort of comparison, we basically chose 10 classes from ImageNet. That is roughly corresponding to the 10 classes from CIFAR 10, right? So basically we choose a class that is war plane that is corresponding to the plane, um, uh, tree frog that corresponded to the frog, tow truck that corresponded to the truck and so on. So again, what we want to see is that whether this kind of branching structure we observe kind of show up in different model data pair. And that is indeed the case, right? Um, and so on. So you see those branching structure uh, mapper graph as well across different models. 
So, so, so like I said, this piece is purely um, experimental. So, so the takeaway is that the more you're going to see more clear bifurcation as you go deeper in the model, and both foreground and background activation plays an important role in the class separation. Um, they are relatively stable with respect to perturbation. Uh, and then those branching structure you observe can be generalized to other model data pair, okay? So that's that's the image activation. Um, okay, any questions so far before I move on to word embeddings? I think we have one in here. Yeah. Okay, another question, sorry. Um, so, okay, going back to the, the way that you were showing us, you do the mapper, um, I guess, like clusters and then the edges. Um, that made sense when you had like the height map um, that like gave you, you took pre-image of, here's this interval, pre-image of that, that's my cluster. How do you do that with the L2 norm? Because shouldn't the neural network say, oh, I really recognize this cluster of images as these are all airplanes or these are all, um, uh, horses or whatever, but sh shouldn't those have very similar norms? And so shouldn't they be put in the same cluster, even though they're separate classes? Yeah, yeah. So good question. So so what happened? Again, I lose my mouse. But uh, if you look at the ResNet 18, if you look at the L2 norm, uh, if you look at the, there's a like, like there's a chain of very mixed nodes, right? Mm -hmm. If you go along that chain, it's actually in decreasing L2 norm. So our our frame, our code actually can color those those mapper graph by L2 norm. So actually, when you see all this branching, the tip of each branch, at the very tip of each branch, those are the highest L2 norm. As you move towards the branching point, the L2 norm decrease. Oh, so so towards, the, towards the outer edge of the circle, that's the most confident. It has the highest L2 norm, <laughs> meaning that the, the neural network is reacting to this image most strongly. OK. Yeah. But it, it, it couldn't it also react strongly. Like, wouldn't the L2 norm say, oh, the neural network's also reacting strongly to something that's like, uh, oh, well, OK, I guess your output's normalized. But couldn't it say, like, um, you know, that this may be a mix of three classes or something like that? I guess I'm just I'm confused how L2 norm doesn't um, like erase the difference between being accurate and being inaccurate. Ah, yes. Okay. So, so, so I will show you later that there is a correlation between the purity of the node and the accuracy. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so in general, the L2, the one with high L2 norm, remember this is the last layer. Almost all images are pretty, pretty accurate predicted. Okay. But there is definitely a decrease in a lot of cases when you're moving towards the branching point. Okay. Yeah, hopefully I have a plot later on, we'll show you this. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Hey, right. I can so, ask a quick uh, question slash idea? Yeah. yeah. Yes, so the, if you go to the last slide. Yeah. Um, so, um, right, these are just combinatorial graphs. I yeah. guess with the filtering function. Yeah. So um, you know, it doesn't matter if you if you have the central node, it doesn't matter if you order the spokes like A, B, C, or A, C, B. It's the same thing. Yes. So with with two mapper graphs, it seems you could come up with some, you, you know, algorithm to lay them out in similar yeah. ways. Maybe this becomes more interesting with like four mapper graphs. Have you thought about these types of things? Yeah, so the, 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 I actually got, the, I, I think I got this question multiple times, how to lay it out so that you have the best comparative way. So one way to lay it out, which actually our software has a has an option, it's not the default option, is to lay it out based on L2 norm. So you kind of stretch it out from left to right. So you kind of have a hierarchical layout of it. So that could allow a more, um, so right now this is a, what's called force directed layout. So it's like there are springs between nodes, you want to minimize energy. So you just try to occupy the space as much as possible. Um, but you can do this hierarchical layout so you can have a, in some sense, better comparison. Uh, yeah, is that what you're going after? Like a different layout algorithm? Yeah, yeah, but I'll, I'll propose something different, which is what if I want um, two mapper graphs and I want to be able to th compare them visually, try uh -huh. to find a layout where those two mapper graphs are laid out as close to in a similar way as ah, possible. Yes. So that, yes. you know, 
right? Yes. Um, so yeah. So so yeah. So so actually, we we work a little bit over there, not exactly on the layout, but actually on uh, mapper graph comparison. So we actually have a way to uh, to find uh, to match one mapper graph to another. So my argument is that the moment I know the, how they're matched with each other, with their matching knowledge, I can lay it out. Or with their matching on knowledge, I can just do a color transfer, right? The first mapper graph, I color it. And then that color transfer is going to transfer to the second one based on the underlying matching. Then you can also establish correspondences. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Right now, right now all those mapper graphs are corresponding to each other because they share the same class of images so they are colored by uh image labels yeah so okay all right so let me move uh, on to the second part okay yeah i actually had one more question in here that's okay yeah right. this is this will be a quick one um just like kind of going back to the thing Jacob was talking about is it correct to say that a strongly identified frog and a strongly identified deer will both have high L2 norm, but will be part of different clusters? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, but their, their relation isn't completely linear. Uh, it's a general trend you see when you go towards the end of those, but it's, it's a little bit mute to kind of, oh, sorry, oh, what's the word? It's a little bit tricky to discuss it in this current setting because ResNet 18 was highly accurate. It has 98% accuracy. So almost all classes are, correctly um how to say predicted in terms of its ground truth label right so um we do have a separate work that hopefully we're going to submit soon that talks about uh this mapper graph under adversary attack so and there you can have you can have pretty bad accuracy with certain certain data i think my confusion i think makes more sense now um i think what i was confused about was that like Bef way back before when you're talking about the filter function, you could have the pre-image could be like disjoint clusters yeah. and you get three different nodes. So yeah. even though they're L2 norm, they look like they were in the same height, they're in different clusters. Yes, yes. That that is actually a very, very important characteristics of yeah. mapper graph construction, is that even though all those nodes have the same level of activation, but they belong to different parts of the space that I'm exploring. So that's why there's three cluster instead of one cluster because right. underlying metric, which in this case, I'm using Euclidean metric, separate okay. those three clusters. Okay, thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, so, so in a newer work, I start referring to those mapper nodes as what I call topological neighborhoods in oh. some sense that each of the nodes corresponded to a topological neighborhood. So you might have three neighborhoods in that case where mm -hmm. they all have the same level of activation, but they are far away from each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the second piece, I'm moving on to a uh, language model. Again, what you do, language model, BERT, is uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. Just think, think about I can probe the... BERT, which is a pre-trained language model, like here is a description uh, here, right? The BERT is sort of bi-directional encoder representation from transformers. It's a transformer type model where you basically, instead of probing it with um, images, you're gonna probe it with sentences. And you're gonna look at the token, which is word in the sentence, and you're gonna obtain a high dimensional representation of this. This is referred to as high dimensional word embedding. So the first set of example I'm gonna show you are probed with more than 4,000 sentences, which contain 80,000 token. So in this case, it's a, I'm using contextualizing embedding, meaning that a word, say my book, my in the sentence versus my bike, my in that different sentence will have a different embedding, okay? So now again, what is a pipeline? Uh, here is a bunch of sentences contains specific token that I'm interested. So all of those sentences on the left contains the token me, so the, and it has three sentences that contain the token me, but each of those token is going to have a different embedding in high dimensional space. And, uh, and again, I'm going to apply mapper graph to obtain its summary. And, uh, and uh, similarly to um, the image activation, 
This is what I call token or word activation or word embeddings. It also has really interesting structure. So here's the first bifurcation. So um, BERT is a language model that has, uh, we're focusing on 12 layers. So this is the original BERT model it has 12 layer. So I believe this is layer nine. I couldn't see my title of my slides. Um, so here you see a bifurcation. Remember, I have a very complex mapper graph and I'm going to focus on small areas of it. So I'm just going to zoom on into one section of it. And in this case, I am looking at uh, node A, which I'm going to show examples of token and sentences in there. And this is a bifurcation, what I call temporal versus locative bifurcation, which is basically one branch contains, say, if I look at node A, it contains the embedding of the word in or on. It's always in 1701, on January 17, 1831, in the 14th century. So similar with B, okay? So both A and B is one side of branch that corresponding to the usage of the word in with respect to time. And the other branch, which contains note C, is like in Cleveland, Florida, in Rust Belt, in Moscow. It's a usage of the word in with respect to location, okay? It's the same word, but in different usage, okay? So the motivation is that BERT is a language model that is used for many NLP tasks, okay? So the question is, why is it working so well, okay? So this is one way of investigating the word embeddings generated by BERT and what is the topological structure of those word embeddings, okay? So this is the first example. Second example, this is a branch all of this involving two words, me or my, okay? So if you look at the branch involving node B and C, there are sentences like this is what's called persistent form. My mother, my dog, my bike, my old heart, my first autograph, right? That is a usage of my in the persistent form. The other branch is she invited me for tea. She looks at me. Uh, Pete looks at me. This is what's called uh, personal pronoun, me, okay? So the, now there's different usages. But interestingly, in node B, it also contained this sentence that I was writing me bike. So it's in the same branch with my dog, my mother. So it's actually used as if it's persistent form. So we argue that this is a local dialogue. You know, the me actually is actually mean, meaning in the contextual sense, it's actually used the same way as my. Right? So this is, again, a differentiation between how the word is used in the context of the sentence. The next example is what I call real world knowledge. Right? So I'm not going to go into all detail. This is a section of the mapper graph that start from, if you look at note A, it's all the words and in context related to the sea, like sea, marine, waves, and so on. But as you go along this branch, you're going to arrive at C. It became water, rain, and then it's become water in the sort of cooking, right? So water, uh, two cups of water, and then it became like liquid in cooking, like oil, olive oil, vegetable oil, and so on. Uh, and you know, so so it's sort of like it captures real world knowledge. But as you move along this mapper graph, it's look at slightly context switch. Um, same thing with, uh, so, okay. So this, all, all this is like layer nine, but if I go to earlier layer, it's much more focused on syntax and non-contextual meaning. And later layer is focused most on sentential and semantics. So this is earlier layer, layer three. So you see a branch that what I call branching between size and goodness. One branch is going to say, oh, you know, like the D branch, it says uh, impossible and hard. The C branch start by looking at most, best, highest, and largest, okay? So those are much more focused on the meaning of the word themselves instead of the meaning of the word in the context of the sentence because this is in the early layer of the model. And finally, this is one example where my collaborator got super excited and I was like, uh, what are you talking about? But this is basically, there's a very, there's some sort of usage of the word when and if a very difficult to characterize. Both, both of those words are used to convey what's called temporal meaning. 
And the word when is also used to introduce discourse relationships like explanations or something like causality, right? So again, we see a bifurcation between those words that is really picking out fine level differences um, in language models. And uh, the idea is that this can be served as um, ways to develop posters for NLP expert um, in the future. Okay, so that's the second piece. Any questions? Okay, so now I'm gonna go one step further um, and also focus on word embedding. Um, there's one thing that people like to do when they study word embeddings. The ones I showed you is just a pre-trained bird model and probing it. But in a lot of cases, they are going to take a model and they're going to fine tune it. The main idea is, so here's an example of uh, a projection of the word embedding using a TSNI, okay? But what do I mean by fine tuning? Fine tuning is as follows. So usually those large language model takes hours or days to train. Like nowadays, like GPT, chat GPT takes, you know, a lot of power to train. So you don't want to really train from scratch for every single NLP tasks. So what you do is you pre-train a large model, and then you are going to fine tune it with smaller data set, uh, which is faster. And then you're going to tune it for specific NLP tasks, okay? So what do I mean by that? So I have um, three type of NLP tasks, and then I have three type of models. So BERT, base, Robota. Robota is a more robust version of BERT. BERT Tiny is a smaller model that only have like a smaller number of, of uh, layers. So in terms of number of parameters, BERT base has 100, 110 million parameter. Robota has 125 million. Uh, Bird Tiny has 4.4 million, which is comparatively speaking, a much smaller model. The right-hand side, I'm showing the data I'm using. It's basically think about token or word that has label, like ground truth label. Remember in the image classifier, I have 10 label because I have 10 image classes. Here, this, one of the tasks has 42 labels. Those are just different label coming from the language uh, tasks. To go into a little bit of detail, there's like, you know, super, uh, super sense and a dependence relation. So SuperSense is a task of predicting core semantic categories of proposition called SuperSense. <laughs> and a dependency relation is uh, assigning a dependency label to pair of token in a sentence, okay? Um, so think about those as different data set, which can be different embedding, and each of the embedding has a different label, ground truth label. Okay, so um, remember I talked about purity here, let me quantify it more. So the idea of a purity of a node in a mapper graph is basically how many classes it have. If it's only have one class or the, or the embedding has one label, then it's pure. Otherwise it's zero. Uh, if it has all the classes, then it's zero, okay? So it's a way of looking at how pure my local neighborhood is. So this is sort of the interface um, for our visualization tool. By the way, all the previous talks, uh, the previous parts also have some code associated with it. But here is a mapper graph of the word embedding. Um, and you can look at a particular node and look at the composition of how many labels in that node. And here is sort of the exploration specific. The table shows the ex examples of sentences attached to that node, okay? So here is an act animation, right? So here's how you run the tool. You pick of a data set with a model. You look at a particular layer of the model. You like the fine tuning process and you recompute the mapper graph on the fly. Um, and then you basically look at how the mapper graph change as I'm fine tuning my model, okay? So there's other parameters you can tune and so on. But now what you're seeing is that you see those little chains or little neighborhoods of the language model and you can click on a node. You can see what is the sentences attached to those nodes and how are they mixed from each other, okay? Okay, and of course, you, the, the Lower bottom corner is actually the PCA projection of this point cloud. So you want to compare the projection of this point cloud with respect to the topological summary of the point cloud. Okay. Uh, what else is doing? Uh, right. So so again, when you see as as uh, um, oh yeah, you can also search and highlight. You can search specific label. For example, the nodes with this label is going to be distributed in different parts of my mapper graph. So you can actually do a dive into how those different uh, labeled 
word embeddings are distributed. Um, for example, four is all in all those different parts of my macrograph. Anyway, so. Um, So what are the use cases? The first thing we're going to look at is how does my mappergraph change during refinement? So think about the mappergraph on the left is the original mappergraph of a model before fine tuning it. The right is after fine tuning. So we basically do 175 steps of fine tuning. So one thing you can observe is that as you go during fine tuning, my mappergraph become pure and pure. So the nodes, if you see the nodes, they at the very beginning, they're very mixed. And on the right, they're actually fairly pure. Okay. When I say pure, that means the classes are actually separated from each other. Remember, this is completely unsupervised. I'm not using the label in part of my mapograph construction. They're just colored by the label, the ground truth label. Okay. So, um, and then this is a difference between different model, BERT and Robota, or have roughly 100 million parameters. So this is the last layer of refinement. They all have a very pure behavior in terms of mapograph. On the right-hand side, this is a much smaller model. Remember, it's only have 4 million parameter. So even the model has converged, you see a lot of mixed behavior of the model, which is an indication that BERT tiny is not as powerful and not as accurate as BERT or Robota. Okay. So the next thing is, like I said, this is a pure chain. And you can see a similar phenomenon of how it's, it's differentiating the space of embeddings. So all those uh, embeddings contain the word as. But from left to right, as you move along the chain, you move from what they call fronted usage, which is basically start the sentence with the word as, versus non-fronted usage, which is as is in the middle of my sentence. OK, so you can see those kind of phenomena encoded in the mapograph. This is an unpure chain. And then this is what I would call is indicate model confusion. So in this case, all those sentences are related to the token for and. Um, um, but they have a different label. OK, so now the question is. Can we explore the sentences with this label? And in this case, is that the argument that the model got confused because all those sentences were discussing something related to money. So the like, for example, for more than what I paid, for that amount, for a truck, for something you want, you know, $80 for a dish, all those are discussing related to money, okay? So that's one of the reason that the model is really confused, uh, even though they, they actually, the ground, truth, the ground truth label are very different. The next one, this is another bifurcation in the mapograph. Uh, again, this is for BERT-based model. So there's two label here. Of course, I'm not an NLP expert, but our expert feedback says amount and compound are two class label, but they are linguistically very close to each other. One is related to adjective noun relation. The other one is representing noun noun relation. So this is, again, an area where the model is confused. You see a very pure branch, which is purely dark blue and purely um, uh, purple. But then you also see branches or nodes where the model is getting confused. So you can use, again, use this mapograph structure to explore and hopefully improve your model or improve your ground truth label, because some of those may relate to a wrongly labeled data. And the final one that I think is very fun is you can also, everything I talk about so far are training data. I can also use a look at validation data. So validation data are the one that is not used as part of the training. So what we can do is looking at the embeddings who are coming from validation set and look for the nearest mapper node that it is what I call attached to. And if there's a disagreement over attachment, this is actually one indication that the model is going to make with high probability a wrong prediction on this validation data set. Okay. And we have multiple examples of this. Okay. So, what is a high level insight? I know I only have five minutes, so I'm going to go through insight. The first one, now I have to move my, sorry, now I can't see my title on top. Okay. So, the first, <laughs> the first insight is that, um, well, I still can't see myself in this case. Okay, the first insight 
is a fine tuning changes the topological structure in higher layer more than the lower layer. So specifically, like this is at the earlier layer, left is before fine tuning, right is after fine tuning. This is a uh, layer nine, and then this is layer 12. So the fine tuning is changing the mapper uh, structure much more drastically towards later layer. That's the first one. The second one is it changes topological structure of embed embeddings in higher layers more than lower layers. So this is where I talk about the distances between mapper graph. So the mapper graph changes much more drastically in later layers. And then you can also look at the topological neighborhood purity change. So this is a kernel density distribution of all the node purity. You can see from the top to bottom in layer one, the purity doesn't really change much. But in layer nine and 12, you see that the purity really shift to the right, which means that all the nodes are becoming more and more pure. Oh, by the way, from top to bottom is different refinement step going from the step zero to step 179 or 75. The third one is the average topological purity is correlated with the model performance on unseen data. So the left is the purity plot, the right is accuracy plot. So there's actually a correlation between those two. Specifically, that the highest correlation between purity and uh, accuracy is actually in layer nine. And there's a lot of more publications about the special layer nine be a very special layer. Um, and then the purity of the neighborhood of a validation point can also be used to predict the correctness of the model for that point. So this is how you relate the mapper graph of training data with the um, validation point. So in some sense, when you are looking at the local neighborhood of validation point, it's as good indication whether the model is going to predict it correctly or incorrectly based on the nearest neighbor in the mapper graph. And finally, um, this is sort of observed both from geometry or topological perspective, is that points of the same label will move closer and points from different label are going to move further away from each other. So this is sort of the, the projection of the word embedding before and after refinement. This is the mapper graph before and after refinement. So uh, I'm going to end my talk with sort of uh, what I consider as the next steps is uh, talking about um, uh, theoretical foundations. Uh, you know, everything I showed you so far has been very highly experimental. So what are the theoretical foundations to support this? Uh, we already made some progress in looking at distances between mapper graph and how the mapper graph is, you know, how, how those bifurcation structure is gonna show up. Um, we also want to look at more semantic analysis associated with the branching. Um, there's also discussion about sampling condition. When does this structure converge uh, and so on. So there's many interesting theoretical questions that is underneath there, but I think all the experimental evidence has been very promising. So that's it. All right. Well, before we get to uh, the public questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud for our speaker. All right. Let's go to questions. Further questions? Jacob has one. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, uh, this is all very interesting. Um, and I guess looking at the like BERT um, mapper graphs, um, I'm wondering, do you think it's feasible to do like uh, evaluate like student performance, like on tests or something like, like try and probe their understanding of some concept in a similar way, trying to build a mapper graph? Um, I mean, I guess like the complication would be you can't just like, you know, stick an electrode in their brain and say, this is the activation when they see this integral or something like that. But <laughs> Um, yeah. maybe I could interpret like them being able to like distinguish certain concepts or something like that as like, uh, um, or, like score, like probability, like can't I, can't I interpret like probabilities as like activations? Like, isn't there some connection between if, um, if, if a student has a high probability of getting a question, right, that means they have a high understanding, like a high activation of some concept. like, uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so there has been some work, I think, um, there's faculty, uh, in, if you send me an email, I can send you some references. There has been some work uh, coming out of Stanford that is using mapper graph to study data coming from neuroscience. 
So that is sort of the closest I could say mm -hmm. about this. I mean, to be fair, I did not invent MapperGraph. Uh, th this sure. whole algorithm is, was invented by Singh and uh, collaborators. I think it's Singh, uh, Falcontu, uh, Marmoni, and uh, um, uh, uh, Garner, Garner, Garner Carson, oh. right? So the mapper construction has actually been used uh, across many different domains in analyzing high dimensional point cloud. So uh, yes, if you have high dimensional point cloud um, and you have uh, some sort of filter function you can use, you can definitely look at bifurcations. Uh, in the past, it has also been used to study like, for example, cancer data to look at bifurcation of different subpopulation uh, sub of people with breast cancer. So those are some of those earlier adaptation of this algorithm in studying high dimensional points. So here um, I was mostly focusing on at what I call artificial neural activations, right? So those are activations coming from neural networks or deep learning models. Um, I think generalizing this to real neural networks, I think it's a much more complicated scenario. The first question is what data do you have? Yeah, I, I remember. Thank you. Hey, the name you were searching for, the neuroscientist at Stanford, I put one guess in the chat, was it uh, Manish Stagar? Yes, Manish, yes. I, I, my my head was running a little bit blank, but yes, Manish is the one who did a lot of work in that space. Further questions? I have one. Um, so the I sorry, I'm trying to like phrase it in a way. I I guess kind of what I what I want to do with this is see if there's a way to sort of not just like after the fact analyze a neural net, but during training use this sort of topological information. It's sort of like, I mean, when when you showed that graph of like filtrations providing node purity of like, you know, like sort of like that seems like a good metric for, okay, my, my neural net is doing a good job of distinguishing things. So have you played around at all or do you know if there's any like work with like using something like mapper or some something topological during like a neural net training to sort of tell you when you should stop training yeah or so Yes. So, okay. So let me answer this. So, okay. So there's two things. So first of all, with the this, this current system, which we call Topo Bird, which is focused on just word embeddings, um, you can imagine what I call fine tuning process is actually part of the training process itself. It starts with a pre-trained model, but the fine tuning is basically improving the model one batch updates at a time, right? So, so in a way that what I'm visualizing is indeed how the model is evolving as I'm fine tuning it. So that's my first answer to you. The second answer is that we actually um, ran a user study involving six NLP experts. And one of the first thing they jump on is precisely what you, you asked, is that can I use MacroGraph and the purity as a guide so that I don't necessarily have to use like say my accuracy. So when I terminate my training, I can have things like early exit. So, which means that um, if my purity is reached certain threshold or specifically if uh, a small neighborhood that I really care about reach a certain purity, I don't care about the rest of the model. This, mod this area is doing pretty well. Then I'm gonna have an early exit of my model. So is, is that what you are referring to? Yeah, I think that was basically the idea of circling around. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think I think there needs to be more experiments in this space. I mean, we see a correlation between um, between purity and uh, accuracy, um, but a correlation is not causality, right? So, uh, so we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but there's definitely experimental evidence that you know, uh, in some sense, for example, if you look at layer, this is a case. Okay, here. Um, here is a, here is a example of, uh, how the purity looks like across different fine tuning process. If you look at layer nine, layer nine, actually, um, you know, if you look at how the, how those purities are distributed, like around like 60, 70 step, like refinement, the, the purity is also already very good. So the question is that, okay, you know, do we want to just stop my refinement there or do you want to keep going right so so yeah so this is another way to 
really assess how your topological structure has reached certain kind of, not exactly convergence, but certain kind of stable state. More questions? Um, I do have one. Uh, it's, it's kind of specific, but um, so when you were looking at the the word embeddings in the bird model to the um, the different layers of the encoder layers, yeah. Um, you you mentioned, I guess, qualitatively that earlier in the layers, the attention mecha mechanisms were sort of encoding the information about syntax, and then as you moved further on to the layers, it was the, the attention mechanisms were capturing the semantics of the words. Like you use those, yeah. uh, um, you know, words with uh, the same word with different meanings. Yes. So I was just wondering, was there, what, did any of the NLP experts have a reason of why that actually happens in the, in that first, first portion of the encoder layers? Because like uh, <laughs> so, I don't think it's obvious why why that actually should happen. Uh, yeah, I, right. So so I guess the question is, <clears throat> why is the early layer most focused on syntax uh, and later later layer more focused on semantics? Um, this, this is actually something that an LP expert has observed before. Um, why? Uh, I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. why that is indeed the case. Um, but you also kind of see this also for image classifiers, because in earlier layers of uh, convolutional neural network, they were more detecting things like lines, straight uh, horizontal line, vertical line, and then it's move on to corners, and then move on to more complicated uh, uh, visual features. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a very good explanation why earlier layers are more, um, more syntax and later layer is more semantics. My sort of non-expert explanation would be that in the earlier layers, it hasn't really integrated enough information from the, remember this is what we call contextual embedding, right? The embeddings are involving with respect to uh, which sentence is part of. So my, my non-expert justification here is that in earlier layers, the model hasn't really taken to too much context into consideration. Uh, that's my explanation of that. But I think the strength of using MapperGraph to analyze those word embeddings is actually really, really pick out uh, fine level detail of the embeddings and how they differ from different part of the embedding space. So, uh, and then those are the things I argue it's very hard to obtain if you just use a dimensionality reduction. Thank you, thank you. Any final questions? One more? No, I'm, oh. this, this is me winding up. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, Bay, for a fantastic talk. And, and thanks, everybody, for all the good questions. And let us stop the recording here. All right, thank you.